it's really fantastic to be here at QCon New York um, and a massive privilege to be able to give the morning keynote today. Uh, all of those talks uh, really sound interesting and the conference has been really fantastic so far and I'm real excited about the agenda for today. Um, Chuck has definitely made it a tough choice on where to go. Uh, it'd be much easier if it was just a linear choice because then uh, you, know, you wouldn't have choice paralysis. But uh, you know, uh, we are very fortunate uh, nevertheless. So I'm gonna start my talk with my conclusion. Uh, I believe many of the systems that we build today really don't take full advantage of the hardware that is available to them. Sometimes this is by design. Uh, you know, much of our learnings and lessons and things that we've built up over time and, and, and infrastructure, uh, you know, it came from a different world, uh, you know, a world of hardware that had different trade-offs. And some of the times it can be organizational pressures. Uh, you know, your ops team uh, maybe don't want to change uh, onto a particular new piece of technology. Um, I was talking to uh, Sid Anand uh, yesterday, uh, and he was talking about uh, whether I should maybe reframe this title as the joy of building large-scale systems and the pain of operating them. Um, but you know, fear not, we're not all, you're not alone. Uh, we're all practitioners in the room. Uh, I wanna go a little bit into uh, you know, how things have evolved in the industry uh, and things to get excited about for the hardware of today. Now, I'm gonna be talking about various systems and services and design patterns and things that are gonna sound new and novel and often associated with complexity. Um, let me assure you, I really do subscribe to the Boring Technology Club. Uh, you know, if you are a startup, you know, if you're doing you know, less than one request per second, there is really no reason to go through a lot of the struggle at this point in the life cycle with all the ins and outs of building a cutting edge, blazing fast production system because you've got other things to worry about such as how to survive in business. Uh, you can get your favorite cloud provider or some vendor to run it for you for a couple hundred dollars and you can really focus on building your business uh, with plenty of options to scale further. This talk is more for the people who are sort of in that mid-tier, so not in like the hyperscalers, you know, if you're Amazon or Google or Netflix, then you've probably heard all of this before. Um, but this is for, you know, the vast majority of people who are in the mid-tier, uh, where, you know, you have some sort of business need uh, that you, is being served by software, but it's not being done in the most efficient manner. So think of this talk as a little bit of a retrospective of where we've been in the industry and where systems are heading in the future. So before we dive too deep, uh, a very quick introduction. Hi, my name is Sahail, um, and I am a staff engineer at a company called Monzo, uh, based in the UK. And I work in the platform group, uh, and we provide all of the underlying infrastructure and libraries and tooling so that engineers can really focus on building banking software and not have to worry about uh, you know, how their systems are running and whether they're reliable and whether they're up and whether the database is gonna be backed up and, and, and things like that. Um, if you folks have ever worked with Heroku uh, or like similar platforms, uh, that's the sort of experience, the magical experience that we try to emulate, uh, but in an opinionated manner, suitable for a regulated environment such as, such as, uh, such as banking. Now, um, many of the folks here wouldn't have heard of Monzo. Uh, so we are quite popular in the UK. Uh, we have over 7 million customers. Uh, I think we are the seventh or sixth largest bank in the UK. Um, and uh, our unique selling point is that we have an app and we have no physical branches. Uh, all of our branches are on GitHub. Uh, we power... <laughs> It's true. We actually have an API, uh, which we're mandated to have, uh, which is slash branches. Um, and that API has an empty response, and it quite literally says all of our branches are on GitHub. It was the easiest API that we've ever had to write. Scales to infinity. It's fantastic. Um, we don't have to keep it up to date. We wrote it basically on day one when the company started and I haven't had to change it since, which is really fantastic. So yeah, we power all of the banking features through an online app. Um, if you've heard of Chime here in the US, uh, we're very similar. Um, but I think we have nicer looking cards, uh, in my opinion. Uh, that Coral one really does stick out. And unfortunately, I don't have one on me today. Um, but if you do want to have a peek at one, um, then uh, I'm sure we can make that happen. Um, and you know, we are fully licensed and regulated, just like all the other big players um, in the UK um, and also here in the US. Uh, so you know, we are under the exact same constraints. We can't just move fast for the sake of moving fast. You know, with seven million customers, you can't play around with people's money. 
Now, typically, um, you know, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, you'll, you'll find me in QCon London, um, and usually I'm on the architectures or the microservices or the platform engineering track uh, at QCon in London. And our whole philosophy at Monza is to build uh, infrastructure using composable microservices. We have over 2,500 microservices in production, uh, you know, powering all different parts of our, of our banking backend. Um, now, a lot of people sort of like gasp at that and it's like, oh, well, there's so many services, especially because we only have a few hundred engineers. Um, but we are a consumer-facing retail bank with direct integrations with uh, you know, payment providers like MasterCard. Um, and uh, in the UK, we have the Faster Payment Scheme, so it's like, you know, similar to ACH and, and like, you know, all these various different schemes that provide different payment integrations um, in the UK. And we have uh, integrations with the vast majority of them. And all on the screen are all the different services uh, that we develop just to power one of these many schemes. So for example, when you tap your Monzo card, which is integrated with the MasterCard network, uh, you know, all of these services need to get involved in order to process that payment. Uh, you know, this includes things like you know, maintaining a banking ledger, making sure that you are a valid customer, making sure that your card is valid and hasn't expired, make sure that you're not using it for nefarious purposes, uh, you know, and make sure that we fight financial crime. You know, we are under the same uh, regulations and restrictions as most of the other, other consumer banks. And we want to make sure that a payment is legitimate and it is actually the customer that is making that particular payment. And or I mention all of this because all of these systems and services uh, need to talk to databases and queues and other core abstractions. So you can imagine that those core abstractions and core systems get a lot of request volume uh, and you know, have, a, have a very high throughput. And you know, these things need to be fast. Uh, you know, we don't want you to be waiting at Whole Foods uh, forever, waiting for your card machine uh, with a spinner uh, to process that particular payment. We want you to be in and out as quickly as possible. And the retailers also want the same. So in actual fact, uh, MasterCard mandate, uh, they only give you a couple seconds before they will make a decision on your behalf. And that decision that MasterCard makes is usually a much, much poorer decision than one you would make internally. Uh, so it is in our incentive as a bank uh, to make sure that we make the best decision for our customers uh, because it also saves us money in the long run. Uh, and you know, th uh, that sort of time constraint means that we need to be fast. Now, speaking about speed in the base layer, let's go a little bit back to, back to the core abstractions uh, portion, uh, get into the nitty gritty about why all of this matters. Um, if you've ever uh, opened a computer science course or uh, an algorithms book, uh, you would have come across a BT, uh, B tree data structure. Now, B trees are typically used as index implementations in many popular databases. Uh, you know, if you've ever defined an index using uh, the create index command, it's almost certainly going to be implemented as a B tree or some variant uh, of a B tree and represented in your database system and on disk. Now, uh, I want to you know, present this slide just so that you can keep it in mind. Uh, we will be revisiting this uh, in, in a couple of slides. Um, in 2012, there was a publication on latency numbers that programmers should know. Um, and I've put some, num uh, some of those numbers here on the screen, and we'll revisit these in a little while to see how they have changed. Now, keep in mind, for example, the last number there, the cost of a disk, seat, uh, disk seek. Um, now, you know, th these numbers are a little old, um, but you know, I'll, throughout this talk, I want to talk about how some of these have changed in order of magnitude as hardware has advanced, and how we should be building our systems uh, to be able to take advantage of these orders of magnitude changes. Um, but it's still important to keep in mind now. So going back to B trees, um, if you're familiar with the binary tree, uh, B tree is very, very similar. Uh, where you've got sorting of elements, uh, which means that you can traverse the tree in order. So I've got lots of boxes here with numbers on them, and it all looks very complex. Uh, but imagine that they are a like a you know a reference to a primary key, an ID, or something like that. You know, 82 might reference a row, uh, which is like my record, and you know, 83 might be Sarah, and like you know other people in the audience. Uh, so it's like a, effectively a key value lookup mechanism. So similar to a, to a binary tree, uh, doing a search uh, is you traverse the tree in order. Similar to doing a binary search in a large list, you start at the head uh, and you make your way down uh, to the node that you are trying to find. 
Uh, you can find almost any record by traversing the, the tree. Um, and in this particular example, you can find any record in four comparisons, which is pretty good going. Uh, four comparisons, you could do that relatively quickly, uh, and it's pretty good going. Um, so imagine all of these items corresponded to a data record, uh, and the numbers are an identified to that record. You're going to want an efficient representation, so you, know, you don't have to traverse every particular element to get to uh, you know, a particular record. Now, imagine that you want to insert an item. For example, we have uh, that subtree highlighted in orange there, and we want to add a few more records that align with that particular area of the tree. You know, we're getting a few inserts to our database, uh, and we want to add a few more records. So we've added two more items there. Uh, maybe these are two new customers uh, in, you know, in banking parlance or, or something like that, 86 and 87, which is all fine and dandy. Uh, but this tree is now looking a little bit imbalanced. You know, we've got quite a few uh, things clustered at the, at the leaf there. Um, so we're going to have to do a little bit of rebalancing. Uh, you know, most of our leaves there have two or three records, and this one is, you know, sort of like clustered with five records, um, which is which is not ideal. Um, so B trees, uh, one of the properties is that they need to self-balance uh, when uh, you know you've inserted a bunch of items in the leaves. So we're going to juggle these items around uh, to maintain an optimum distribution. So many implementations will try to prioritize keeping the height at a constant level, so you don't have to do too many comparisons. Uh, but we can rejuggle this tree around to make sure that we still keep the same height uh, while still maintaining a good distribution within the leaves. So here is our rebalance tree. We've shuffled a few other things around. Hopefully the animation wasn't, wasn't that quick. Um, but yeah, you know, all of the items in red have been sort of reshuffled so that we have more even distribution of the load. Uh, and we no longer have five leaves, uh, five nodes clustered against one leaf. Uh, but we've had to do quite a few different operations in order to make that happen. Now, I don't know if folks remember this. Um, you know, this is a spinning platter hard drive. Uh, you know, there's a mechanical head that sort of whizzes around and makes clunking noises, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's all fun and games, uh, except when you put a magnet to it, and uh, you know, all of your data is erased, uh, which I may have done by accident uh, quite a few times uh, when you whack some hard drives in a drawer. Um, but <laughs> going back to V trees, uh, you know, they are a data structure that lives on the hard drive. Uh, you know, when they were originally designed, as opposed to, for example, being in, in RAM, uh, you know, where it would be much more volatile. Like, you know, you want to keep these in a persisted medium. Um, so that allows the B tree to grow as your data has grown because, you know, RAM wasn't, uh, you know, all, all too massive uh, back in the day. Uh, and when you were running low on RAM, you still wanted an ability to uh, be able to look up things in your B tree as your data set grew. However, if your data is written over time, uh, your B tree isn't going to live on a contiguous place on your spinning platter hard drive. Uh, you don't want your B tree to be splattered all over your hard drive, uh, but you know, that's what you end up with. Uh, because your B tree grows organically over time. You're adding records over time. Uh, and you know, uh, different blocks are going to correspond to different elements of your B tree. So that means every time you need to do a change or a lookup in your, in your particular B tree, for example, um, if you remember our search example from, from uh, 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 the previous slide, you know, we had four comparisons. That means that head needs to move to different places and you need to wait for the spinning platter to spin around and, and you know, get into the right place uh, before you can read that that bit of data. Um, and that's a couple milliseconds right there, you know, when you're uh, accumulating it all and uh, aggregating it all, uh, just getting the read right head into position. Uh, and imagine you need to do that a couple of times within your B tree. Imagine that, that uh, the top to bottom has grown into like 10 comparisons, for example. That can accumulate really, really quickly. Now, you know, the, the era of hard drives might have disappeared. I don't think anyone is running uh, systems with, with spinning rust uh, nowadays. Um, if not, then you should definitely, if you are, then you should definitely uh, look into NVMe SSDs. They're great. Um, but if you're on uh, cloud storage like EBS, uh, you know, each time you need to do a particular operation, you know, that, translate into, uh, that translates into an I.O. operation. And you're going to be billed for that. Uh, and you know, there's a fixed capacity that you uh, need to provision up front uh, so that they can provide you the quality of service. So this kind of stuff still does matter. Uh, you know, where if you were to choose a different algorithm, you might be able to do all of these lookups in one I.O. operation. Now, again, uh, you know, a little bit of an age uh, division here. Uh, I don't know if folks are uh, old enough to remember the days of disk defragmentation. Um, 
the general principle, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm hearing a lot of woos, uh, so yeah, I think there's definitely a division in the room. Um, the, <laughs> the general principle, especially in the days of spinning platter hard drives, was that you want to lay out your data to minimize the amount of seeking you want to do, uh, you need to do, uh, and to minimize the number of uh, operations you need to do with your read-write head. Um, if you lay it out in a linear manner, uh, you could take most advantage of the hardware. And it's why defragmenting your hard drive made your computer feel much faster. It wasn't just moving these colored boxes and look all pretty. Uh, you know, it did make your computer feel faster because uh, it relayed your data out in a manner which was much more efficient for reading, uh, which is what a lot of our systems do nowadays uh, you know, when you look at read-write ratios. Now, uh, there has been some research. Um, even in the age of solid-state drives, you know, SSDs, um, SSDs are much more efficient reading sequential data than doing random access. Uh, the above chart is from 2009, uh, but you know, the premise for optimizing for, for reads uh, and sequential reads very much exists today. Um, on many SSDs and NVMe drives, you can read one kilobyte or four kilobytes of data in a single I.O. operation. Uh, and that seek operation is much, much quicker. Uh, but if your bytes are scattered all over the place, you know, if you've got a couple bytes here and a couple bytes there and a couple bytes everywhere, uh, then you're still gonna have to do a bunch of I.O. operations even on an SSD, and that's gonna accumulate much more than just doing a single I.O. operation where you can read a bunch of kilobytes of data all in one go. Um, and ultimately, that reduces the performance of your application or your database because you have to remember that when these database systems are running, you're doing millions, if not billions, of these operations, uh, and that accumulates uh, very, very quickly. So when a lot of algorithms in most of the modern systems we uh, run today were designed, we really did have a completely different set of trade-offs. Uh, to read an item from disk, we really were talking milliseconds. Uh, and with SSDs, uh, that reduced by an order of magnitude to sub-millisecond. I remember when I got my first SSD on my machine, I was like, wow, everything is so blazing quick. Uh, and now with NVMe SSDs, uh, that has gone even further into, into nanoseconds. And again, with throughput, uh, you know, a hard drive, you know, you, you'd be able to saturate it at like, you know, 200 megabytes per second. Uh, and nowadays with NVMe drives, uh, you can breeze past at multiple gigabytes a second. Um, you know, there was a there was a talk um, uh, earlier in the in the week on Tuesday, I believe, uh, from the folks at ClickHouse, you know, where they were able to analyze over a billion records and at a couple gigabytes per per second, uh, which meant that you could uh, search through a couple billion records. Uh, in under one second, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, I saw an NVMe drive a couple days back, uh, which could uh, reach over seven gigabytes per second. Uh, so some of these drives are getting wickedly quick. They're getting so quick that uh, they're looking at adding uh, water cooling uh, to the hard drives because they're generating so much heat. Uh, so that's the level of absurdity that, that we're getting to, is that we can't keep them cool uh, for the speed that we're reading, uh, the speed that we're reading and writing to them. Now, all of this is fine and dandy. You know, this is like effectively, you know, uh, our next uh, like Moore's law almost, right? Uh, because many of these improvements we can take advantage of without much work in our systems. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, this is uh, some research from the folks at Samsung uh, uh, where they, and, and you know, they, I guess they do have a bias because, you know, they, they make some of these drives. Um, but you know you can see how there is a massively different order of magnitude uh, in the amount of transactions that we're able to run per per minute uh, for this workload that they were running for different types of drives. So you know NVMe drives have absolutely breezed past compared to like you know SAS H, uh, SAS hard drives. Um, so yeah, you, you know you can get. Uh, a lot of the benefits of you know, uh, added CPU or network headroom or faster disk speeds uh, just by deploying our existing applications on more modern hardware. Um, so this was a MySQL workload uh, where they were uh, testing some transactions. Uh, now this might sound a little bit contradictory to the B tree example that I gave a little bit earlier, uh, because clearly, you know, by doing nothing, uh, you know, we've still been able to realize speed gains uh, and, and you know a massive amount, of, uh, a massive order of magnitude, because uh, there's much higher throughput that we see here. Um, but with a few tweaks in our software, uh, you know, we too can realize even further orders of magnitude or, of gains, uh, and that would take much better advantage of the speed of hardware. 
Now, there was a really interesting research article that I came across a couple of days back uh, on uh, I.O. performance. Uh, and uh, this is the level, again, of like sort of absurdity that we're, we're, we're getting into, which is, you know, uh, a bunch of folks have realized that, you know, soft applications are difficult to change. So what they're going to do is they're going to uh, implement some stuff in device drivers for disks, because, uh, you know, disks nowadays are little mini computers anyway, um, you know, where they're going to translate random write calls. Uh, so you know, when you're doing random random writes uh, into sequential calls at the device layer. Uh, so you know, they have their own separate lookup table and they try to optimize uh, for doing uh, sequential writes rather than random writes. Uh, and uh, this matters because it helps reduce wear and tear on NVMe drives and, and SSDs. Now, even if you're running in the cloud, you still got to worry about this because you know, uh, eventually if you wear out your SSD, you're going to get a very nice notification from AWS saying your instance is being retired, uh, which means that you you have made the hardware sad, uh, and you know it's now time uh, for you to exit. Um, now, uh, <laughs> this matters because in their benchmarking, uh, you know they achieved a five to eleven percent uh, increase in write transaction throughput uh, for common file systems. Uh, I think eleven percent was for X4. Uh, so, I mean by, again, just putting this into the device driver, they're able to realize further speed gains, uh, and you know we can take advantage of these again for free. So shifting away from the world of hard disks uh, and into the world of CPUs, uh, you know, we've continued to see, uh, see 10 to 15% uh, year on year gains in single threaded performance. And you know, this is a far cry away from, from Moore's law in, in effect for the last couple of decades, but we're still able to extract significant performance out of a single thread. Uh, you know, it, it's not just about adding more cores and, and, and more threads to our systems. And it's not all about CPU clock frequency either. Uh, the caches on CPUs, for example, have got a much, much larger too. So I've plotted uh, different types of EC2 instances, uh, for example, um, and I've plotted their L1 and L2 cache sizes um, for their various different uh, compute optimized instances. Now, the leap might not look that dramatic, but you know, uh, every time we've doubled these, uh, these sizes, uh, the probability of a cache hit uh, can dramatically reduce the amount of CPU cycles spent. Um, I don't know if you remember the latency numbers that I showed a little bit earlier, uh, but the cost of an L1 uh, cache hit versus an L2 and L3 cache hit uh, can make a dramatic difference on how quick your application uh, performs. An L1 cache hit, remember, is 200 times more faster than going into memory. Now, even as an industry, for a long amount of time, we have focused on x86-based processors, um, and now many providers are providing ARM-based CPUs. Now, uh, some of this you may argue is for like you know competitive advantage, maybe trying to get rid of the Intel AMD uh, uh, foothold uh, in the industry. Um, so there may be other perverse incentives, but uh, ultimately, uh, you know, there is some benefit uh, for us as as consumers. I remember when I got this uh, like M1 laptop. Uh, I still don't believe to this day it has a fan uh, because I've never heard it. Uh, it does have one because like, I've opened the screws and it does have one. It's there, but I've never heard it. And you know, my Intel machine, you know, it'd be running away. I'd be nice and toasty up on the stage, uh, even presenting presenting these slides. Now, I've personally not used these ARM-based CPUs in in data centers, uh, but the folks at Honeycomb who are here today, um, uh, you know, have reported a 30% improvement in price to performance uh, for their server fleet. Uh, and all they had to do was to tweak their, their CI to build artifacts for ARM uh, and take advantage of this. 30% is a pretty remarkable number. Like imagine you were able to go to your, your CFO and say, well, you know, there's a potential way we can reduce our cloud spend by, by 30%. I'm sure they'd be elated. Uh, don't know if that would translate into your pay packet, but uh, you know, that's by the by. <laughs> There is one principle about distributed systems that uh, has remained true and probably will never change, which is the network in general has not gotten more reliable. Um, if you're building a system that spans over multiple machines and they need to do some coordination, there's still a heap of work that you need to encode in your systems uh, to handle network disruptions. But networks have gotten significantly faster. 
uh, in our original latency numbers, uh, you know, it assumed a one gigabit network, which is you know perfectly fine for for back in the day, which is completely reasonable about a decade ago. But you know, ma most providers, even on the like basic tier of instances, uh, give you 10 to 25 gigabit networks, um, even on the bog standard generation of instances. Um, and our networking software has also gotten much, much, much quicker. Uh, you know, there has been a significant focus on hardware offload and pi uh, bypassing the traditional OS networking stack uh, through things like uh, Express Data Path and, and a bunch of other, other technologies. Because CPUs can't keep up with uh, the amount of processing that needs to happen uh, for these super fast networking speeds. Uh, you really don't have time to door door uh, when you're getting tens of millions of packets per second. Now, whilst you can definitely sustain tens of gigabytes per second, uh, I'm afraid there is one thing that has remained true, especially if you're on the cloud, which is the pesky bandwidth egress charges. Uh, it hasn't become any cheaper, uh, I'm afraid. So yeah, uh, you just get to spend more money quicker. Uh, but if you do need to, if you if you do need that that level, uh, that le uh, you know, a high throughput interface, it is available to you. Um, so yeah, going back to our latency numbers, uh, you know, our L1 and L2 caches have gotten much larger. Uh, so the likelihood of a cache hit and skipping main memory has gotten much larger as well. Uh, we didn't have a chance to dive into like you know uh, optimizations in 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 memory and RAM, um, but we're seeing massive iterations in the DDR spec, uh, which brings three to four times higher throughput and bandwidth. Uh, and this is especially important for multi-core systems. Uh, you know, memory is also getting much, much, much larger. And it's now common to get hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. You can get machines with like, you know, multiple terabytes of RAM. Uh, and for many of us, we can fit our entire data set into main memory, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, and it almost negates the need for, you know, uh, disk access in the first place, apart from just a persistent storage medium. And hard drives as well have gotten remarkably quicker, uh, and it's removed a massive source of bottleneck, especially if you needed to read something off disk. Now, in 2005, uh, there was an article titled The Free Lunch is Over, uh, which I think is a very remarkable title uh, by Herb Sutter. Um, and you know, the article sort of talked about the slowing down of Moore's Law uh, and how you know, the dramatic increases in, in CPU clock speed were, were coming to an end. Um, I was a little bit young at the time, so uh, you know, I don't think I quite grokked the article at the time, and you know, I'd be lying if I said I read it in 2005, uh, because I would have been 15, um, so th that probably didn't help. Uh, but in, you know, when you read it in retrospect, and I'm gonna bring you some, some choice quotes, um, I, it's almost as if like, Herb had a crystal ball into the future. So take a second to digest that quote there. No matter how fast processes uh, get, uh, software consistently finds new ways to eat up that extra speed. And if you make a CPU 10 times as fast, software will find 10 times as much to do. Uh, you know, uh, uh, our applications haven't gotten any faster. You know, if you open an app today, it's, uh, you know, it's spinners galore, uh, you know, whilst waiting for things to load. And, you know, we're not waiting for things like networking and, and, and uh, other associated systems. Like, this should be quick. You're just writing a few rows to a database. It should be quick. Why is it so slow? Um, so, you know, gone are the days where, you know, you would be, where you could see the capital expenditure uh, in racking your own servers and data centers. Uh, you know, we've become accustomed to the world of infinite compute, especially because we're running in the cloud. Uh, and, you know, we've taken advantage of it by writing distributed systems, uh, but, you know, they have not scaled uh, massively well. Uh, and, you know, we've just shifted our complexity into running many, many more machines. Uh, you know, you may have often heard the phrase, let's just throw more machines at the problem, or let's just make the machine bigger. Uh, rather than look at why is our software so slow for the machine that it is currently running on. You know, we've often erred towards scaling upwards and outwards because that is an easy fix. You just pay a, you know, your favorite vendor a bit more money and you can get a faster instance probably up and running in minutes. Um, so her predicted in 2005 that the next frontier would be in the world of optimizing software. And as practitioners, uh, you know, we would be racing towards that frontier. Uh, and that frontier was declared to be concurrency, for example. Um, and you know, uh, Herb had a very great, great quote, which is, uh, you know, engineers have now finally grokked objects, uh, object-oriented programming, and now concurrency is the thing that we had to, to grok as an industry. 
So Herb's thesis was that engineers uh, would need to become very proficient at efficiency and performance optimizations to identify places where concurrency uh, could make your applications faster. Uh, and Herb predicted that languages and paradigms would lead to like, you know, uh, heavy optimization work uh, and that will find new life and that will be the next frontier. Um, and I think in today's era of software, uh, that realization is more true than ever, but I think we have sort of had a gap for the last 15 years because in that meantime, cloud has come along uh, and you know, the cost of getting a, a server is now pennies. Now, why does all of this matter? Um, cumulatively, we use approximately 1% of worldwide power uh, on data centers. Uh, now, some may argue that 1% is not that large of a number uh, and compared to many other industries. Uh, and, you know, for example, when you put it in comparison to the monetary or the societal value that is being added, it is not that significant. Uh, but our, compute, uh, sorry, our demand for, for compute is ever increasing and there is no reason why we should be wasteful. Now, there's a really fascinating report that I read a while back uh, which stated that 50% of greenhouse gases um, are due to infrastructure and software inefficiency in the data center. Now, that figure on the asset seems really, really high, but I think, you know, you think about the software that runs in your organization, and when you account for like, you know, provisioning buffers and serialization overheads and runtime overheads and operating system overheads and virtualization overheads, the inefficiency does accumulate, uh, and we can see how that 50% comes about. So software, uh, so hardware has gone much faster, uh, and you know we've got a lot more throughput. Uh, and what can we do in the world of software to take advantage of some of these optimizations? Now, none of these ideas are very revolutionary, but you know, uh, in our multi-threaded applications, uh, you know, we typically follow the shared everything architecture. Uh, you know, we have our data in memory, and we work on different parts uh, of the shared address space at the same time. Uh, and naturally, if two cores need to access the same piece of data, say you get a request writing, uh, uh, writing a particular record, uh, and you need to read uh, from that particular record, you're gonna have to use some sort of synchronization primitive. Now, for example, with a thread per core design, uh, your application is bound uh, to a particular CPU thread, uh, and uh, you, know, you partition your data space so that each core is handling a different part of the address space. And this pattern requires a bit of effort to encode because your application needs to be aware and needs to partition this particular data space, and you've got to have some form of request steering so that two requests for the same record at the same time go to the same core uh, effectively. And whilst they would now run in serial, by removing the synchronization overhead, uh, reduces the amount of CPU context switches. Now, it's not only about uh, data though. Uh, CPUs need to do context switching for things like interrupts. So, uh, for example, when networks pa network packets come in uh, and they need to do CPU interrupts, uh, you don't want to be doing those on the same core where you're running your application because you'd have to do then some context switches. So being able to have some sort of core affinity uh, you know, can really speed up your applications and reduce the amount of cache evictions that you're constantly doing. So in Linux, you can use features like IR queue to pin network requests to particular cores, uh, which is really handy. Uh, there was a paper in 2019 uh, that measured the impact of tail latency of doing this. It's not very complicated to set up. Uh, you can find some commands on the internet, uh, maybe a bash script that you can curl in, uh, you know, if you're feeling uh, also inclined. Uh, but there was, a, there was a paper in 2019 which measured this for memcache and Sphinx, um, uh, pinning particular CPU cores uh, using IRQ, and they found a 71% reduction in tail latencies, uh, which is, again, pretty, pretty significant. Now, this model isn't revolutionary at all. Uh, you know, maybe I'm like over a decade out of date, uh, but you know, systems like Nginx have been doing this for ages, uh, and we've massive benefit. But uh, as an industry, we haven't really uh, encoded this into our applications. Uh, this kind of programming can be quite fiddly, uh, and you need to get deep, for example, into the networking stack and you know your application stack and build a model for you know thread-based message passing. Um, there's some really fantastic work in the world of open source uh, with systems like. C star uh, from the folks at SillaDB, um, and they have a really nice tutorial uh, on how to get started. Um, so if you are a C++ user, uh, definitely check that out. Now, even in the world of uh, I.O., uh, there has been some significant uh, advancements. So I.O. Uring, uh, you know, the world of asynchronous I.O. in Linux has typically been quite complicated. Uh, you know, you can get into a world where, for example, 
buffers were full or by the time uh, you know, the I.O. you were doing wasn't quite matching what the file system was expecting uh, and you'd filled your disk request queue, uh, which meant that your asynchronous call had now become accidentally synchronous. Uh, and there was a lot of memory overhead as well with asynchronous I.O. Um, so I.O. Uring provides a new interface uh, and at the core, it like, you know, looks quite simple. There are two queues. You have, you submit your requests into the submission queue and you read your results from the completion queue. Uh, so you've essentially got two ring buffers uh, and you keep going round and round and round. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the, on the outset, uh, it looks quite simple. Now, this has had a dramatic effect though on the industry. This is now like all merged into the main line within the, within the Linux kernel. Um, so the, here's, here's some uh, analysis that was done. Um, so here's two charts of random reads and random writes for four kilobyte block size. Uh, and I was talking about random reads and writes uh, in the context of B trees a little bit earlier. Um, so if we're using standard Linux async IR operations, there's a cap on the number of operations we can do before we are starved. Um, and look at that chart on the bottom there. Uh, IO Uring compared to uh, standard Linux IO, it's an order of magnitude difference. Now, just over the last couple of weeks, uh, LibUV, uh, which is a widely used uh, library for um, async IO, added IO Uring support. And I love this comment from the uh, pull request author, which is, performance looks great. An 8x increase in throughput has been observed. It's almost like nonchalant, uh, but I love it. Uh, now, it's always important to be wary about benchmarks because benchmarks can tell whatever story you want them to tell. Uh, but it's still like you know, any sort of multiply improvement is a great improvement for users of LibUV. Um, and this is work that is happening in the community right now. This was only a couple weeks back. Um, and even IO Uring is continuing to evolve. Uh, there's an active effort in, for example, making network IO uh, go via IO Uring uh, and for that to have zero copy uh, to extract even more performance. Now, moving away from like specific features that are like in, in specific languages and, and the kernel, uh, the world of programming languages uh, itself has seen very rapid development. Uh, to really take advantage of development close to the metal, uh, you know, you'd usually have to resort to using C or C++, which is difficult and error prone, and you know, you've got memory leaking everywhere, and you know, it, it is difficult, and I could see why engineers would want to avoid that. But with the rapid rise of program languages like Rust or like you know, even Zig, if you've not checked that out, it's, it's, really, it's a really, really cool program language, uh, the world of systems programming has become even more safer and the tools around it have become really, really delightful. The barrier to entry uh, for these program languages are much, much lower compared to, compared to C and C++. And you know, just picking on Rust specifically, I'm not a Rust fanboy, but you know, uh, I have a very strong admiration. Uh, you know, it's not a niche technology for hobbyists anymore. You know, organizations like Amazon and Google and Microsoft have gone all in. Uh, and they're using it in core components like Windows, like EC2, like S3, and more. Now, if you do have the opportunity to, to, to check this out, uh, you know, have a go with Rust. It's, it's a really fantastic program language. Um, for example, I've worked with uh, Python. I've written C modules in, in Python, and I found it really, really difficult to, to get right and, and package. Uh, but you know, Rust has some really nice bindings with PyO3, and sort of the, the ecosystem maturity uh, and the developer tooling is really quite phenomenal. You can get up and running really, really quickly, which means you don't have to worry about the fiddly part of, of uh, packaging and building wheels and eggs and, and, and stuff like that in Python. Um, the ergonomics are much better. Now, there was some research in 2017 on the energy efficiency around different programming languages. And they used a data processing task uh, for this particular, particular test and then ranked different programming languages uh, for energy and time usage. Now, this isn't a programming language debate. Maybe we can duke it out in the, in the foyer uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, but it's interesting to see how different programming languages compare. So for example, Python, uh, my, my darling love child, uh, you know, is 75 times slower uh, than writing something in C or Rust, uh, and that is, that is just such a massive delta. Now, many moons ago, I used to work for a company that dealt with public transit data. Uh, so think buses and trains and, and you know, all other forms of public transit. And I'm going to give a pretty benign example. Uh, you know, we had millions of timestamps uh, that we'd need to parse and process. And this was happening on the hot code path. And all these were ISO A601 timestamps. Uh, so there was no variation to worry about. And we were just using naive 
Python date parsing libraries, you know, the stuff that's included in the standard lib. Uh, and we change this out to a C-based library, uh, you know, a, a third-party C-based library, and so a 10x speed up. A 10x speed up in this hot path just for parsing a date string. Um, and that's how I really got interested in this space and efficiency, uh, th this particular space uh, of, of compute efficiency. It's quite a minor change when you look at it in the outset. Uh, but when you're doing this processing millions, if not billions of times per second uh, at runtime, uh, you know, if you truly understand the constraints of your system, uh, you can make, make some wicked fast improvements. Now, I had a go over the last uh, couple of weeks and months on uh, trying to put this library to Rust just to, you know, practice what I preach and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, be able to come up here and say, okay, actually, you should really do this uh, uh, to get up and running. Uh, so again, if you've written C Pythons in uh, so C modules in Python, uh, you probably. Uh, have recognized how difficult it is to, to get right. There are a lot of foot guns. Managing the global interpreter lock in C is an absolute nightmare. Managing uh, and translating objects between Python and C is an absolute nightmare. Uh, and dealing with pi object all over the place, again, a massive nightmare. Uh, and then you've got to figure out the magic incantation of your setup tools and your make file to get it all right. And yeah, it's just an absolute nightmare. Uh, but in Rust, for example, there's this really fantastic tool called Maturin, uh, which is super nice UX. You install it using pip. Uh, and you can call mature and new, and you can have a package up and running, and then you write your code. Uh, you know, this is the only bit of code in this particular presentation. Uh, we're not gonna do a Rust 101 or anything like that, but hopefully the code is relatively easy to follow. Uh, you know, we've got a library, uh, we've called the R ISO 8601 library. Um, the, that's the name of the module, and we've got a particular function that you can call from Python, uh, which is the parse date time function. And all we need to do is to fill in the middle. Right? So in the middle there, uh, we're gonna be, uh, you know, if you have a particular timestamp, I'm sure pretty much all of us in the room can figure out how to parse this particular timestamp. You extract all the number components and put it into the Python representation uh, and whilst keeping information about the time zone. So there is some implementation there. Uh, the code is pretty benign. It's just walking through the string uh, and you know, parsing it into, into its numerical components and building up the Python date time object. Um, and if we get some malformed input, we can raise a Python stack trace uh, and exception uh, information as well. Now, once we have all of that implementation, we can use Maturin, for example, to build a Python wheel. And again, this is really, really simple. You run this one command, I've not had to touch a make file, I've not had to touch setup or disk details. Um, it's really, really easy. Um, and it, this is ready to go on PyPy. Uh, or you've got a wheel that you can distribute in your wheelhouse uh, and you know, send to your other engineers that they can use as a library. Uh, we've not had to do any heavy lifting here. Um, and you know, if you call a Python interpreter, you can quite literally import that module, call the function, and uh, you are ready to go. And now you are using Rust and Python seamlessly. Uh, and again, we've not had to do any heavy lifting. So I'm not advocating that you know, we uh, stop everything that we're doing now and switch to writing all of our software in C or Rust or Zig or, or what have you. Um, you know, there is an inflection point and you know, typically it takes a long amount of time for organizations to realize this. Uh, you know, for, uh, to start with, we optimize for development and organizational costs. Uh, you know, we want to get something out there as quick as possible uh, and you know, you know, see that if it will generate revenue or, or what have you. Um, and whilst we are doing that, there is an inflection point where the system's runtime cost is getting uh, linear or if not exponentially higher. Um, so there is a runtime cost uh, that we need to consider, especially as our systems continue to scale. And hardware has changed really quite significantly. And there is a big focus in the world of software uh, with new frameworks and tools to take advantage. So let's go through a, a few of those very, very quickly. Uh, you know, in, even, even in, uh, in some of our mature ecosystems, uh, you know, in Java, for example, uh, there has been a big focus on language features. Um, but the one that I've been most excited about is, is the uh, ZGC garbage collector. Um, and you know, it gives sub-millisecond pause times. Uh, you know, garbage collection is a, you know, a significant time consumer within your applications. It can affect your tail latencies and, and, uh, and you know, make your systems feel slower. Uh, but ZGC, sub-millisecond pause times, no matter how large your heap size is, even if it's multiple terabytes. Um, and this isn't some distant reality. This is production ready today uh, with LTS support in Java 17. Um, 
So, you know, if you're running, for example, like a Cassandra or a Kafka or, you know, any of these systems that rely on Java, if you're writing Java applications yourself, Java systems and services, definitely check out ZGC. It is production ready. We're running it in production. And, you know, we found, you know, sub millisecond pause times. I, I thought I'd never see it, uh, but it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. We're very close to a world where we have basically nearly pauseless Java. Um, and again, like, you know, even basic optimizations uh, that we can do in our applications. So uh, this is an example from our, our production workload. Um, you know, uh, this is an optimization we did uh, to the JMX exporter, uh, where, which we run alongside Kafka. Uh, this is an exporter that exports Prometheus metrics, uh, so metrics into our telemetry system. Um, and we use tools like Java Flight Recorder and Mission Control uh, to find out where the CPU was being spent. And we found that a significant amount of CPU was being spent in a, in a code path, which was just doing a bunch of redundant string comparisons. Uh, so we put in a bit of a hash map. We traded off a little bit of memory, uh, I think a couple megabytes of memory, and we were able to halve our Kafka CPU utilization, uh, which means that we have much less garbage being created uh, and you know, much more CPU overhead uh, for, uh, you know, for, to be able to scale out our actual Kafka application rather than spending that time in redundant uh, metrics collecting. Now, Flight Recorder comes embedded with JRE 11 onwards, so there is no reason to not have that available. Uh, Node.js, for example, has a dedicated performance team, uh, and they're doing some fantastic work to, perform, uh, to tune performance for uh, underlying APIs that engineers rely on. So, for example, reading an ASCII encoded file uh, has seen a large throughput jump uh, in Node 18. And even Python is getting a massive speed up as well. Uh, there's a small task force uh, you know, being run under the Microsoft umbrella and led by the BDFL of Python, Guido van Rossum, uh, to tackle some of the performance bottlenecks in, in Python. Um, and you, know, you can take advantage of all of this as well. Like, you know, there's a little bit of work for you to do if you're on Python 3 in handling you know, maybe a deprecated library or two. Uh, but you can introduce this in your programming tool chain as well and take advantage of these optimizations in production. Now, in uh, you know, the company that I work for, we write all of our systems in Go, and this is something that we expose to all of our engineers. We give them access to all of the profiling tools. These profiling tools run with very small amount of overhead uh, in your production application. There's no reason why uh, you know, engineers shouldn't be able to access these tools and, and take advantage of like, you know, understanding where their systems are spending CPU, CPU time. We have, even have an incentive. We have, like, for example, Slack channels and, and you know, uh, incentives where like, you know, uh, you know, different different leaders come in and uh, you know, applaud efforts to uh, improve optimization. And you know, of course, there is an incentive for us because uh, you know, it means that we get to reduce our costs. But it also means that uh, you know, we have a bit more mechanical sympathy for uh, the computers and the infrastructure that we're running on. And ultimately, that leads to less complexity in our systems. Uh, the least complex systems are the ones that run on the minimal number of machines. Now, even if you have an existing application where, for example, you might not be able to add profiling tools, uh, you know, in the world of the kernel and the, you know, with technologies like eBPF and BPF, uh, you, know, you can leverage uh, kernel level tracing, uh, uh, assuming that you're on Linux 4.1 and above. And if you're not, then please definitely upgrade. Um, my favorite Swiss army knife is uh, BPF trace. Um, and I even like to use it alongside other language specific profilers uh, because it gives really, really good insight into syscalls, into the file system and, and, and a bunch of other areas. And all of the different arrows are different tools that you can use to probe different parts of your operating system stack. So there is, Literally no excuse. Uh, you know, we can go into every single particular area of uh, the kernel and our application stack to get a solid understanding of where CPU time and, and compute time and hardware time is being spent. Now, if you're a fan of racing, um, hopefully this is a fairly familiar face. Uh, this is Sir Jackie Stewart, um, who coined the term around mechanical sympathy. Um, and in the context of motor racing, um, it was about caring and understanding you know, man and machine uh, to uh, extract the best performance. Uh, it's a combination of human and machine sort of coming together. Now, with the shifts in hardware and, and software in general, there is a cultural shift happening in how we write uh, software, even rewriting core software uh, to take better advantage of the hardware. Um, there was some incredible work from Facebook, for example, uh, adding a new storage engine, uh, you know, uh, 
for example, with MySQL rocks. Uh, and we can all play a part in, you know, uh, in that shift. Uh, by evaluating systems that we run uh, and understanding how much power there is in modern computing. Now, throughout this entire presentation, I've not mentioned the word AI, and this will be the only slide on AI, um, and I'm not going to go deep uh, at any moment, but you know, generative AI, can't avoid it, uh, it's captured the minds of masses, uh, and one massive discussion point right now is the sheer cost of uh, compute uh, used to train and serve these models to customers. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this particular space as well. Uh, so Llama, uh, if you've not heard of it before, is a, is a model by the folks at Meta. Uh, and there are some open source implementations um, in C++ uh, that a bunch of folks are building. Um, and there was a really excellent pull request that I came across a couple of weeks back um, where uh, they introduced MMAP, uh, which is very old technology, like you know, probably a lot of people in the audience with systems level thinking, I'm like, yeah, that sounds so obvious. Um, but it led to a 100x improvement in load times and half as much memory consumed at runtime. Uh, and this is relatively modern software. You know, Llama you know, was written this year. Uh, you know, it was written relatively recently. So there is a lot of low-hanging fruit, even in systems that are being written today. Uh, and you know, even old tricks like MMAP and, and memory alignment and thread per core can still yield massive benefits. Now, this is a bit of a hot take, uh, so don't mob me. Um, you know, most of the systems that we build in this room are glorified data processes. Uh, you know, we take some data on one end, we transform it a little, and we flunk it into another end, uh, ad infinitum. Uh, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in that layer as well. Uh, you know, if you do a lot of JSON parsing, uh, there's been a really fantastic library that has been introduced that uh, uses SIMD, uh, single instruction multiple data, uh, to make JSON parsing even, even quicker. Uh, you know, there's a lot of screws being turned, a lot of magnifying glasses being, being, uh, being placed on various different components of our application stack to see where we can extract more performance. So, uh, to very quickly summarize, uh, let's go back to my statement at the beginning of the talk. Uh, many of the systems we rely on uh, were built for an era where hardware was different, where there were bottlenecks in hardware, like you know, your disk wouldn't get any faster or your network was constrained. Uh, the bottleneck a decade ago, or like over a decade ago, was like you know, in network interfaces and hard drives and main memory. But today, hardware has gotten so freaking quick, uh, and the bottleneck is firmly, uh, without shadow of a doubt, in the software that we write. And hardware continues to accelerate even quicker. Um, and you know, these optimizations are now staring at us right in the face. Um, and in many of our organizations, we put up faux barriers. Uh, you know, maybe you have an ops person who's uh, very stubborn and says, we must use Java 8. Java 8 only until you know, the day that I die. Um, but this room is full of smart senior leaders and architects, uh, and we have the perfect audience to lead and influence a lot of these changes. Uh, you know, we're leaving all of these optimizations on the table for organizational reasons, which is quite silly. Uh, these improvements are in production and LTS systems, uh, and there is very little reason to be stuck on old Java or Python or, or Node versions. There are small things that we can do, we can, we can introduce to our organizations to yield massive improvements. Now, we've seen that there are tools out there that allow us to, to, to keep pace. And these are features being introduced at every level of the stack, uh, you know, from data serialization, from network hops, from like, you know, kernel level features, programming languages, even programming language uh, features for existing programming languages. There's optimizations uh, being, being done at all levels of the stack. But it is up to us to take advantage. You know, for example, if you're using older libraries uh, or like, you know, older like language versions, you know, there is some work that we need to do in order to get to the latest and greatest. But these are things that are production ready and there is legitimately no excuse to you know, start tackling some of these things. And hopefully that will allow us to build faster, more efficient applications or rich applications. You know, uh, I long for the day where you never ever have to look at a spinner, uh, ever. Uh, I think that will be an absolute glorious day. So by keeping pace, we can use less compute time, less energy and le less resources for the same level of output. And we can build richer systems as a result. And with that, thank you so much for listening, um, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of the conference.